Thanks. I'll take it from here. Uh, so I didn't introduce myself yet. I'm Matt Ross. I'm the Assistant Director of Conservation for QDMA and the National Deer Alliance. And uh, the first person I'd like to introduce to get things started off is our CEO, Nick Pinizzato. Nick's uh, our brand new CEO with the organization, if you hadn't heard. Um, been with us for a very short period of time, but we've known Nick for a, for a while. I got to meet him uh, a long time ago at a deer steward course. Nick came to a, a class that we held in Illinois, um, and that's where we first were introduced, and he was already in charge of another conservation organization at the time, and he's made his way up through the ranks, finally made it into the deer space. So welcome to, to uh, QDMA and, and the National Deer Alliance's uh, very, or second uh, webinar, the Beer and Deer webinar series. So Nick, please give us a little organizational update for the, for the attendees tonight. Sure, Matt, be happy to appreciate that. I think I ascended to the best job, the best job you could have. So um, no, it really is a pleasure. Great to see everybody again. Thank you for coming to our uh, second edition of the Beer and Deer webinar. Hopefully, uh, if you haven't seen the first one yet, you can go back and check that out. Uh, we, we enjoy these. We enjoy putting, the, putting them together as a staff, and we hope that you enjoy them as well. And, and really, it's my job here to get us through the organizational updates as quickly as possible so that we can get to the man of the hour there, Mr. Kip Adams, who's going to educate and entertain us this evening. So um, just a few things. I want to update you on what's going on with the unification of the National Deer Alliance and QDMA. Uh, we're very close to getting our board pulled together. And um, uh, once we do that, once we get the combined boards, uh, we'll need that to get approval on a name that we've picked out. So what I can tell you is that we at least at a staff level have a name that we like and we'll run that by our board. And if they like it, we'll be announcing it to you. And so right now, uh, the plan is to do that in early November, uh, just in time for the rut, at least for, for a lot of the country. And, and I should point out at this point, everybody here should, it should be a hunting season where you're at, no matter where you're at. Uh, we appreciate you taking out time this evening. Maybe there's even somebody sitting in a tree stand somewhere uh, trying to watch this and hunt at the same time. If you're in the Midwest, it's the golden hour right now. So I would suggest you probably get focused on that. But uh, strategic planning is going well. Uh, we're going to announce some of those outcomes as well in early November. So look for a uh, pretty significant announcements that's going to answer a number of the questions you probably still have with all of this. Um, it, more at our branch level, I can tell you that um, some of our branches are now conducting some fall fundraisers. Now, of course, these aren't exactly as uh, the fundraisers may have been in the past, uh, whether it would be due to obviously the challenges posed by COVID, uh, how we're doing fundraisers these days, but people are doing the best they can uh, to try to raise money in support of deer and hunting. Uh, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, research, research, uh, the pandemic has not stopped research. And that's a good thing. And we are actually involved with four different research projects right now. Uh, we're working on a tick study with the University of Georgia. Uh, with the University of Tennessee, we're doing a, a habitat carrying capacity study. Uh, with Michigan State University in Cornell, we're doing a CWD study. And you, many of you may have gotten the message from us, if you're a member anyway, if you're signed up for our newsletter, uh, you got the message for us asking you to participate in that survey and, and basically tell us uh, how you personally deal with CWD in your area. Uh, so that's a cool study. Uh, and also uh, the Southeast Deer Partnership a project we're working on right now. Um, that, that really uh, looks at the benefits of deer hunters. Uh, it's really to all of conservation. So you'll be seeing a lot more about that as well. Uh, quickly on the topic of chronic wasting disease too, I wanna, I wanna point out that we have two really great resources right now on both the QDMA and, and National Deer Alliance websites where you can go and uh, learn more than you ever wanted to know probably about CWD, but it's important that you do that and understand uh, what you can do to, to try to help slow the spread of the disease. Uh, some other cool things going on. So we just added a field dressing video to our YouTube, uh, YouTube channel. Hopefully you'll, that'll come in handy to you right now. Uh, we've also add, added an updated shot placement uh, anatomy video also to our YouTube channel. And there was also a piece about that in Quality Whitetails, the most recent issue. Uh, obviously those are critical things to know as we're out there uh, with, with bows and arrows in a lot of places. So um, also, we'll, be, we'll soon begin our first public land habitat enhancement project on a national forest in Mississippi. Uh, that's, a, that's a first for us and another cool project we hope to report uh, more to you on when we have more time. Uh, we mentioned, I think, last time, but I'll reiterate that we're going to be hosting the Southeast Deer Study Group uh, meeting in February. And this will be an opportunity, really, uh, I'm sure for many of you to attend this and, and hear some of the, the greatest, most exciting, hot off the press research that's happening right now on deer. 
uh, because of that virtual format. So again, you'll be seeing more on that as we, as we head closer to that event. Uh, quality whitetails. It should be in your home by now. I've got my copy right here, uh, nice and handy. Uh, so uh, be, sure to, be sure to check that out. It's another great issue. And I bring that up just as a reminder because in my message to you there, I, I reminded people that uh, to please reach out to me personally. I look forward to that. I'm totally open to hearing your thoughts and suggestions as we go through uh, the merger or whatever it is we're, we're doing uh, at NDA and QDMA. Uh, definitely want to hear your suggestions and feedback. Uh, I like seeing deer pictures as too. I want to hear your deer stories. So don't be, don't be shy. Some people took advantage of that. I could tell when the magazine was getting in people's mailboxes uh, because that's when I started to get messages and I really do appreciate them. So I'll reiterate that as well. Uh, so with that, it's enough for me. We have a great show for you this evening, the October law. Is it real? Is it not? Uh, Kip, I'm hoping that uh, you don't take my best excuse away as for why I haven't been terribly successful just yet. So um, no pressure, but I want to hear about all the reasons that it's not my fault uh, that I'm still carrying that buck. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Nick. Nick's calling in from uh, Pennsylvania, another Pennsylvania uh, resident. Kip Adams is our feature presenter. Uh, many of you know Kip. He's uh, our director of conservation, as I mentioned, but for those that don't know uh, Kip's background, grew up in Pennsylvania, um, was eaten up with deer, decided to go back, go to school for it, and got degrees in wildlife from Penn State University and uh, the University of New Hampshire. And that's actually where Kip and I both uh, ran into each other, was in the state of New Hampshire. Only after he left graduate school, he worked with moose there and worked in the state of Florida as a uh, um, a wildlife management area um, biologist running a whole uh, area for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. And then came back to New Hampshire, was the deer and bear biologist for the entire state. And that's when we met, I was in school. Um, he did that for several years and then, then uh, left New Hampshire and got, got a job with the QDMA and has been with QDMA for how many years, Kip? Uh, it was 18, uh, two months ago. There you go. Nick oh. closing in on two decades. So full history of managing at both uh, state and uh, management unit level uh, has been a, a stellar educator and you're in for a treat folks. So let's all sit back and enjoy the show. Kip, the floor is yours. All right, Matt. Thank you very much. Hard to believe it's been 18 years. It does not seem like I'm anywhere near old enough to have worked somewhere for 18, but uh, it's been a great ride. And, you know, I, I haven't been as excited about QDMA and this organization, uh, in a long time as I am right now. So a lot of good things to look forward to uh, here in the future. So uh, hey, let's do this, Matt. Let's start like a lot of the stuff we do educationally related. Let's start with a test. And uh, I've probably some people on here right now saying, what in the world? I did not sign up to come sit here and take a test. I said, this is an easy test. It's a one question test. I want to get a little uh, idea of where folks are. Here we go. Everybody can look at this. If you're calling in on the phone, I apologize. You won't be able to see, but everybody who is here, Watching this in person, one question test. And we, you know, the October lull is in the, uh, the title tonight. So here it is. Everybody can see this. And uh, the October lull is described as a, I'll make sure that we know we're talking the same thing, as a reduction in deer movement during the pre rut. And they say, yeah, deer are saving energy to get ready for the rut. So the pre rut is often during October. So most of the country peak ruts in early November. So is October lulls refer to this reduction in deer movement right before the rut. You know, so uh, if you're in uh, many parts of the southeast where your deer do not rut um, in mid to or early to mid November, there's a rut somewhere in the southeast, everywhere from July to February. So if you're one of these other places, just think about that pre-rut period is what we're talking about here relative to the October lull. And uh, what we have is it looks like. Uh, about two thirds of the people have voted. So we'll get the last, we'll give you two or three more seconds, get your votes in. And uh, then I'll share with you uh, what, what everybody thinks here. And then uh, we actually will start to talk. So, uh, all right, we're a minute into it. We have just about everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and end it. And what this showed is that about three quarters of the people here, think that, nah, this October law is not true. So a quarter of the people say yes, about three quarters say no. So uh, this is interesting. Uh, keep this in mind. Let's go ahead. We're going to share some data here, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about this again uh, maybe at the very end. So with that, let me go ahead, Matt. I'm going to share my screen, and uh, we will take a look at a little deer behavior 
and especially talk about movement patterns. Most of this is about movement patterns, but I'm going to throw some behavior stuff in there. And, uh, and we'll answer the question, is the October law a reality? So uh, again, thank you to our sponsor tonight, Mossy Oak. And uh, really, I could have come up with an easier title than this. It's really more about some really cool stuff that deer do. And uh, so there's a lot of things that we know whitetails do. This is one of the coolest times of the year because of all of the pre-rest stuff that's leading, some of the neatest things that you're going to see in the woods are going to start happening really cool or really soon. So uh, we'll talk about some cool stuff about deer relative to behaviors that you may or may not be aware of, and then some movement stuff. And we're going to start with, you know, these are white-tailed deer, you know, but, but why, why do we call them that? Is it just because they have a white tail? It's actually a lot more than that. And this is a big part of survival for deer. And obviously the underside of their tail is white, but as you can see with this deer's tail lifted, it's a lot more than just the tail. It's actually the entire rump area, and it runs all the way up the underneath on the belly. This has a lot more to do with how they see than just uh, why we want to name them this. And this is really because if you take a look at deer's vision, deer see good during daylight for sure, but deer are essentially red-green colorblind. Something that's red or orange looks the same to them as green. So uh, if we have to wear fluorescent orange from a safety factor, that's very, very good. We are not negatively impacting our hunt at all from a deer's end because they don't see that as orange. However, the two colors that deer do see very, very well are yellow and blue because they see way into these blue wavelengths. This lays perfectly with this white tail because what that means is deer see good during the daylight. They see really, really good in low light conditions because of that blue wavelength. So to us, we look at this and we say, wow, that white is pretty bright right there. To a deer, this is like a big beacon that is just flashing. Boom, just like we see almost a line of, like uh, for those of you that are boaters, you know, the buoy lights that are flashing, that's the same thing for deer. So the whole idea of here is when a deer is avoiding predators or is getting away, deer live in many times, you know, a lot of cover or forested areas. Maybe it's, uh, you know, early successional vegetation that's thick. They live in a lot of places that have a lot of cover. So this is a very easy way for deer to signal to other deer when danger is present, look at me, here's where I'm going, this is the big light saying, here I am, come follow me. So uh, a little bit of a survival thing from deer and really the namesake for them has much bigger of a survival function than just a color, color of, uh, of their underside. But uh, another survival function, a little deer behavior thing is when fawns are born, they are hiders. What that means is they don't travel with their mother for the first few weeks of life. They're born, the mother will send them off to hide, and the mother doesn't even know exactly where they are. They will send or she'll send them, she knows the general area, but she doesn't go to them to bed them down because then that would take her scent all the way there. So what she'll do is send them out. If it's twins, they, they bed separately for the first few weeks. So if a predator finds one and doesn't find both, has them bed, and then she will go back to three to four times during the day, call to them. They will stay and come to her and nurse. So then go back and bed again. And phones actually can slow their heart rate down if predators are nearby. So uh, that's why if a fawn is a day or two old, you can just go and pick them up in many cases because they are designed to hide. They don't want to run. So for that first about four weeks of life, that is how they evade, by being hiders. Now, a cool thing, many people know that fawns hide, but fewer people realize really what the mother does. And I have this listed as mother of the year here because there's a couple of things going on. One, this doe is obviously feeding this fawn. We can all see that it's nursing. But in addition to that, you can see this mother is actually stimulating this fawn to urinate and defecate. She's doing that by licking its genitals. Where Matt and I went to grad school, we raised all kinds of fawns there, hired college undergraduates to come and help us, and everybody wanted to come raise fawns. And we explained to them for about the first month, you know, fawns don't urinate or defecate by themselves. So as we're raising fawns, you remember fondly, Matt, I can see you smiling. We would feed them, take a dish rag, rub their genitals to stimulate them to urinate and defecate because they can't do that on their own. Well, in the wild, the mother does that for them. Reason being then, this scent is not near where they are, which helps protect them. Predator's not finding it, but also there's some research that shows that as they defecate, the mother will eat that and then if there is any bacteria in that fawn's body, the mother can actually develop some antibodies against it, put that into the milk and feed those antibodies back to that fawn to help protect that fawn from, uh, from a nutritional thing. So 
it is absolutely amazing how these creatures are designed. Hence, Mother of the Year. My mom is pretty cool. My wife is a great mother. Matt, Sadie is a great mother. I don't ever see my wife or my mom do any more of this. I don't know about Sadie, but uh, I think whitetails are top of the list when it comes to, uh, to Mother of the Year. So. That was that was always a fun uh, uh, discussion to have with the undergraduates that thought they were coming to help and, oh. and work with all these fawns and explain to them exactly what they <laughs> had to do to, to get them to do that. <laughs> you can imagine uh, the fun discussions. All right, well, let's talk about some movements. That the first big movements these deer are making is is a dispersal, and what we're talking about here is all kinds of research, north, south, east, and west, has shown that half to about three quarters of bucks are forced from their birth areas by their mothers. It's not the adult bucks doing this, it's their mothers doing this when they're 12 to 18 months old. So they're right at that year or year and a half old. Most of them will disperse one to five miles away, so a long ways. And about a quarter of them do this in the spring. This corresponds when the next fawns are hitting the ground. And about three quarters will disperse in the fall when the next run or the run is started. So some research also suggests that yearling bucks will not disperse if they're orphaned. That means if you harvest their mother, she's not there to drive them away, so then they end up growing up and right there on that property. And also, there's some research out there that suggests that roads will alter the dispersal. Now, obviously, deer are getting hit roads. We hit over a million of them a year, but uh, some deer just simply don't like to cross them. They could be going miles through forested areas or whatever, hit a road, even a two-lane road, and literally stop and then go parallel with that road before they set up a new home range. And it's actually not just yearling bucks that are doing this. There's a really cool study out of Georgia that uh, from UGA that Jim Stickles did. This is a three and a half year old buck that he had collared. What we're looking at here, this is all of his locations they have with a GPS radio con during the month of June. Now at the top end of his home range here is a two lane road. And you can see here in June, he never crossed that road. And they had multiple locations a day. It's possible he might've slipped across quickly, but for the most part here, every bubble you see is a location. So in June, he didn't cross it. July, he did not cross it. August, they caught him one time over. September, one time over. And October, none. So after the course of five months and literally hundreds and hundreds of GPS locations, this buck only crossed that road a handful of times. So uh, while we do hit a lot, and we're going to hit a lot right now as we're getting into the rut, there are some, some pretty strong evidence of some roads, even small roads, being pretty big barriers to some of these deer. Well, let's... Uh, referencing uh, behavior here we can't be in the fall and not talk about a couple of the really cool things that deer do and some of these play right into some of these movement patterns one is rubbing we used to think yeah bucks are rubbing to get rid of all that velvet do you think this guy has to rub to get rid of all that velvet is that the only reason he's doing that the answer is no not at all this is a, one of the ways that deer communicate and it's something Davis will peak during the pre-rut and then it will maintain a high level of rubbing all throughout the deer season. When deer have hard antlers, they are going to rub. Um, they're not necessarily marking their territory this way. What they're doing though is they can use it a little bit to get some of that pesky velvet off. But more importantly, they are sharing information about themselves and particularly from their forehead gland. If you look at the forehead gland on a buck, University of Georgia researchers have identified up to 47 different pieces of information that they could identify at the, these rub sites where bucks are leaving. So they're sharing information on this is who I am, this is my nutritional status, this is my dominant status. So uh, lots of information sharing. Also a great place to put a camera. I took this picture a few years ago when I was filming with Whitetail Properties in South Central Kansas. No trees around, it's wide open. The landowner, we're riding with it and I said, do you ever put a camera on that? And he said, no, I never have, why? I said, drive us to it, let's go. He drives us to it, look at the bottom. I will guarantee you every deer in the area comes and checks this tree and mark, or this telephone pole and marks it. And you can see how it's whittled away and uh, it's just a way for them to rub, leave their information and then share information with others. So uh, rubs, whether it's on a tree, a fence post, telephone pole, whatever, are great places to put a camera and get an idea of what's going on within that deer herd. Because one of the things that they can tell are, Right now, and this actually, I took this picture just over a week ago here, we're starting to get in to see some sparring. This is from my place. These deer aren't fighting yet, but they're sparring. Part of what sparring is, is pushing each other around, figuring out exactly what they have for antlers, and they develop this pecking order, just like chickens, dogs, or anybody else. Because once they get into the rut, deer don't want to fight. They may get hurt, they may die, they waste a lot of energy. So it really helps them to develop this pecking order in advance of that, and then, once they know, ooh, you know, 
here's Matt and I, Matt and I are pressing, ooh, Matt's bigger than me, he's in charge. You know, then every time that Matt rubs on a pole or pees in a scrape and I go and I smell, ooh, that's Matt, I know that if I see him in the rut, I will back off and know, yeah, he's above me. So many of the big time fights that we see tend to be with deer that are very similar size that didn't have a chance to develop this pecking order prior to the rut. So uh, we're seeing this happen right now. They will then, as they rub at these rub sites, they will know, oh yeah, I know that deer, and they'll know exactly how they fit in together. So a cool way to communicate. The other way that they do, and we're seeing this right now, are through scrapes. And uh, this will typically peak just before the period of peak breeding. So you can actually monitor this on your property. Watch how scrape use is increasing, increasing, increasing. And then uh, all of a sudden that will just really start to slow down. That's when deer are actually breeding. So uh, very, very easy way to tell. This is, you know, one of the more important parts of a scrape. This buck is not stargazing. He is licking up at the licking branch. You know, when deer gets to these, they will rub their preorbital gland on a licking branch. They will mouth it. They may rub their forehead gland. Then they get that just the right smell on it, tear the ground up below it, pee in it, you know, rub urinate in many cases in it, and go. So they're leaving their calling card there again. So great, great way for deer to communicate. And just so you know, the bucks don't just do this during the rut. Deer will use scrapes year around. Does will use them, fawns will use them. They just tend to do it a lot more during the rut. So with that, you know, how often do other deer use them? These are not just for bucks by any means. Here's a picture of a doe at this scrape coming in and getting information. This happens all the time. And then in many cases, they also leave information there. This is very common to get pictures of does urinating in scrapes or even rubbing their genitals on rubs where deer are then. So, you know, it's their version of a cell phone, I guess. They, uh, they have to communicate as well and does are sharing just as much communication as those bucks are. So, all right, well, let's talk about some movement patterns here. And, and I'm gonna share this study because this is one of the cooler ones from, uh, from South Texas, huge study. And we used to think as deer got older, they got bigger home ranges. So let's see, let's see how this fell out. And these are all adult bucks, and they had a bunch of them they were using. Well, that home range, that buck was three and a half years old. This big home range to the right, that buck was seven and a half years old. So we're kind of holding the pattern here going through. And then this little bitty home range, well, wait a minute, that deer was six and a half. And look at this huge one, that deer was two and a half. What we find is this is all over the board relative to home ranges. And what all of the research very clearly shows is that there is no strong correlation with home range, size, and age of deer. All of these bucks are individuals. Some young bucks have big home ranges, some have small. Some older bucks have big home ranges, and some have small. And even more interesting within those, some deer tend to move a little bit during the day. Some tend to move a lot. Regard, or irregardless of what their home range size is. And in fact, you know, this two and a half year old buck, he may not move much at all during the day. So it takes him a long time to get all the way through that. So when you start thinking about home range size and it is literally all over the board and just remember every single buck has his own personality and they all have different movement patterns because of it. This was a landmark study by Dr. Dave Hewitt and some of other colleagues there, they have replicated it. They have done this in Maryland. They have done this in other places as well. And uh, we know very sure, clearly, that there, there's no correlation with age and home range size. So what you do, though, is if you're running cameras and getting a picture of a deer, particularly deer that want to move during the day, you can really get an idea of deer that are more killable using a property that you hunt than others based on what you see. This particular deer, and it's hard to believe this was 10 years ago now, but uh, my brother killed this deer shortly after we got this picture, partly because we targeted him based on some of his movement patterns that we saw here. And uh, you can absolutely do the same if you run some cameras with, uh, with an opportunity where, where you get to hunt. So, well, another part of deer movement patterns that we see are excursions. And now these are very different from dispersal that we talked about with yearlings. Excursions happen everywhere a deer goes well, and this is a long range movement outside of their home range that is very short in duration. And what I'm showing you here in this map, we see these two areas, what we have on the left, this is this buck's home range. He would make excursions though all the way out here to the right. So they often are one to three miles away, but they cover them in the course of one to three days. So it's something they're out there, it's quick, and they're back. It's kind of like a quick vacation for bucks. And what they found in this example in Texas of these mature bucks or adult bucks, um, the ones that had GPS collars on them, just over a third of them took an excursion during the pre-rut. They all did this during the rut, 
and then 41% of them again during the post rut. So there's all kinds of movements now we're understanding deer mate that we didn't used to realize. And this isn't just a cell thing, exact same thing happens in Maryland. You can see a home range at the top, a little excursion area at the bottom, and of 15 bucks in this particular study, not quite as many went on these excursions, but still very common thing and we're seeing it a lot. This is why in a lot of cases, I have a thousand pictures of this buck, you know, and somebody two miles away kills it. Or, you know what, I killed this buck and I have a thousands or thousands of pictures off my place and I've never seen this before. A lot of times it's because these bucks are on these excursive movements and that's when people kill them. So, and this is often when the ladies say, you know what, if the boys would just stay home, things would be a lot better. They wouldn't get in nearly as much trouble. Everybody would be happy. So with that, oh, just, the computer just jumped. With that though, what about door excursions? And this is where we say, you know what, ladies? Thankfully to Penn State, somebody started taking a look at the lady side of this as well. This particular study, they saw these doe home ranges were about 640 acres, but this particular doe from you know, late or mid to late November here, over the course of a few days, here's her home range, and all of a sudden, boom, she just takes off November 18th here through the early 20th. She went on about four miles, was just gone during the breeding season and back. And of the eight GPS collar does they had here, five of the eight did exactly the same thing. So we're seeing this all the time with those as well. And this is probably one of the coolest looks. This is actually in Tennessee. Uh, what you see on the left, the blue, is a doe's home range that they had a GPS collar on. On the right is the orange, that was a buck. And this is where I'll show you these movements. It's every three hours. So during the peak run. So from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. here, what we have is they start away. Three hours later, they catch them together. So about 9 a.m. in the morning, these deer get together. About noon, they're still together. At three, they're still together. 6 p.m., still together. So they were together for almost 12 hours, and then 9 p.m. at night, split again. This is why, why during the rut, you may be so exciting and having a hot, or it may be boring as can be. You could easily be in a place where there's a hot doe a few hundred yards away, so just zero action where you are. And in this case, as we see here, this buck was with her for uh, almost 12 hours. So, uh, and he didn't move a, a long way, so you could have been very close to him never had an opportunity to kill this deer even though it was in the peak of the rut so super cool study though all where right where was she living it looked like she lived right in a parking lot i think so i think she did. <laughs> maybe maybe that's how she survived she was in the parking lot and all the hunters were out in the woods all right well let's address specifically then the october lull i'm going to share a few studies here because uh, I'm, I have hunted a long time and I have some very strong feelings about this from personal observation. This first one was in Louisiana. So I'm gonna share different studies from different parts of the world. This is by Taylor Seminole. He was actually at the University of Georgia. What we see here is the movement. This is daily movement patterns during the non-breeding season. Then I have the pre-rut close. I'm not showing you that yet. And then you can see during the rut, daily movement was a lot higher. And post. So if there was an October lull, that would mean during the pre-rut that daily movements would drop from the non-breeding season. What we see is not that at all. Actually, this the, all these deer from the non-breeding right through the pre-rut, the you know the daily movements were increasing. So it showed, yeah, they increased all through the pre-rut until we got into the rut. So, from a baseball analogy, strike one for October low. Well, let's look at Maryland, and that was the state in the southeast. We can go a little farther north. Uh, this is by James Tomlin. He was a, doing his work at North Carolina State University, but the research is actually in Maryland. You can see here, uh, this is a, the scale is a little different here, but movement in miles per day for deer during summer from their study, multiple deer. Then early fall, as we get into the pre-rut, if there was this October low, we would see a decrease. But once again, we don't. We see movement continues to increase, and this truly was through October. So as they get into the rut. So two studies, two strikes for, for the October low. All right, one more then, we can take a look at Texas. Same thing, both day and night through the pre-rut, this was increasing all the way through as we increased up to the rut. Different way that uh, Aaron Foley from Texas A&M Kingsville uh, depicted us here and just see, you know, there is variation in the daily movements, uh, but overall, continue to increase movement. So uh, strike three, so. Three studies, 
three strikes for the October low. This is with lots of GPS collar bucks show there's actually an increase, not a decrease in those movements during the pre-rut. And if we want one more, Pennsylvania has done all kinds of work. Andy Olson, when he was at the University of Georgia, looked at this. Dr. Dwayne Diefenbach and several of his stu students from Penn State have looked at this. And uh, they have all found exactly the same thing. There, there is not a decreased movement. I share this to let folks know, these are some of the coolest movement maps ever created for deer studies. You can go to Penn State's uh, web, uh, Deer Forest web uh, blog that they have and see these. You can go to their YouTube channel, watch deer. Literally, they will, you can play all these videos and show exact same bucks year after year after year, how closely their movements are during the months of you know, September, October, November, et cetera. It's, it's pretty scary how consistent some of these deer are, but uh, um, the data is very clear, no October low. So, myself included, I'm sure there's some people sitting here saying, well, wait a minute, I have hunted simply too much to not know that, yes, yeah, something is going on. And I agree, I've had plenty of boring sits in, the, in October as well, and, you know, watch deer all summer and all September, and all of a sudden, boom. So, there is definitely differences in where you can see deer during October. They're on their feet, but I think here are some of the ways that we miss some of this movement. One is uh, right about the beginning of October is when a lot of deer have simply shifted from those summer to those fall food sources. So they're changing locations. That's really the time that they change from that summer seasonal home range to their fall home range. So we watch them, they're so easy to see. They're in fields, they're in ag fields, they're in food plots. Oh, and all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. The early archery season, if you can kill a deer, we still in that summer pattern. It is some of the easiest deer of the year to kill. As soon as that switches though, that October, they can become very difficult. But the key is to shift on those food sources with them and you will see a lot more deer. And in some cases we get into October, they are simply responding to, to, to the hunting pressure. They are really, really good to know as soon as we start chasing them and they shift immediately. So uh, this is part, in my opinion anyway, part of what we're seeing here. The science says their daily movements aren't changing, they're just not where we have been seeing them. So uh, they're moving somewhere else. We just need to adapt with them. So a little uh, help from this. So what do you do if you're hunting and all of a sudden you're seeing this big low? I think that we you know, ideally scout for some new food sources. In many cases now, if you're in a mass situation, acorns may be falling or something else where they simply have just moved to feed on some new, find the new foods, you will find those deer. A great way to do it if you don't want to put a lot of scent on the ground is by using cameras. Move your cameras from where you've had them all summer to, to different areas, particularly now you can start using mock scrapes or over scrapes you're finding and you can identify where deer are. And certainly from a hunting end, be very, very cautious of over hunting stands or applying pressure because nothing will change deer movements faster than them or us letting them know I'm after you and uh, I'm here. They can adapt way sooner than we can. So, with that, so I ask a question about an October low. We're gonna do this. Uh, I'm gonna show you one more picture, then I'm gonna close out of this, and I'm gonna launch another poll. We'll see uh, what folks believe about that. But before I do, I wanna thank everybody for their attention tonight for being here. Um, I'm looking forward to a great Q&A session with folks. Um, with my screen on this, I haven't been able to see the chat feature yet. I know Matt has been monitoring questions coming in, and uh, here in a minute, I'll be able to see some again, but uh, this is how you can get a hold of me. Um, feel free to, to, to email anytime, call me anytime. I'm glad to talk, you know, share information, help make you more successful this fall, whether it's managing, whether it's hunting or whatever. And now with that, Matt, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to stop the share. Very good. I'm going to launch the second poll. And remember, we had about three quarters of the first time. So let's go to question number two. We'll do that. There's one, I don't want one, I want question number two. Let's do this. While you're doing that, uh, folks, if you have questions, you can feel free to start typing them into the, to the chat feature and I'll, I'll uh, moderate them and offer them to Kip. I already see there's at least one there. Uh, good job, Kip. I, th I thought uh, that was a, a good uh, overarching message on, on it. And I was hoping you'd get to the point of what do I do? You know, like what, what options are there if you start seeing it? Cause right now is the time that people start seeing uh, a dip in activity and st they start feeling that, but clearly from the evidence, um, from the, the studies that you shared with us, 
deer continue to move. It's just, they're moving differently, right? So you got to figure out how do you get on them? And you may be limited by the property size or even um, being able to, to uh, leave properties or, or not if they're in some other places, but you got to try to outsmart them in the best possible way. So good job. All right. Well, thank you. Can you see the results there, Matt? Can everybody see that? I can. All right. So 89% uh, said it uh, doesn't happen. So uh, we got a little bump there. That's a good thing. 11% uh, are strong. Oh, hey, I am all about being strong in your conviction. So uh, <laughs> I understand for those folks. To those, though, I hope that they do. I hope they're very successful. I hope everybody's successful. And uh, the idea being, let's share some information. We, we want to blend, you know, that science with the art of hunting. It's not all just about, you know, the science for uh, any means. So uh, anyway, I hope that does help some folks uh, get you in the stand. Uh, maybe if you weren't quite sure about going or not, if you get an opportunity to go, go hunting. So uh, use this information uh, to your benefit, and uh, I hope it that allows everybody to be successful. That's so, right. Uh, that's right. Well, hey, hang on, folks. Don't be taking off too late uh, soon. We're going to give a prize here in a few minutes, but let's address some of the questions. One thing I want to add to it is one, one key thing that he said about those studies is they're GPS studies. So these bucks that are researched in all three of those states, um, and actually th then some, there's even more studies that show it. He just picks three representative studies, have what we call GPS collars on these deer, which means a satellite is picking up the location within a meter to two or three meters of exactly where that deer is standing at whatever interval the, the researcher decides. So it could be on the hour, it could be on the, on the six hour, but they, they know exactly where that deer is standing. It's not like the old telemetry where they're trying to triangulate the location of those deer. They know within a couple of meters of where that deer is standing. So, um, Kip, I'll go, I'm going to start going through some of these questions. We got one from Josh Brown. Um, if the movement studies are on bucks, do doe movements replicate buck movements? Meaning, is there a decrease in the amount of activity for does? That's a great question. And now, uh, there's most of the studies we're looking at, at least the early GPS as we're looking at bucks, but uh, the Penn State ones have a lot of does collared. I don't know the total number now because it's so many. It's insane the number of deer they have collared. But, um, but no, we're not seeing a big change in that movement either. So uh, even does continue to move. And that makes sense because they're still feeding fawns, but they have to really start packing on food, uh, on that fat for the winter. So uh, they are moving like crazy to eat. They have got to have all that on. So yeah, does are continuing to move as well. So uh, even if you're not buck hunting early on and uh, you're looking to fill the freezer, uh, you can do so with, with does as well. So uh, pretty cool. Thank you. Next question, Robert Koreski is asking, deer excursions, what time of day are they traveling? Do you want me to take uh, that one? Sure, I will. And if any of these that you want, uh, you can take as well. So, uh, this, this is very interesting because part of it is breeding-based. And uh, you know, think about this. Deer have a couple things in their mind. They're gonna, they want to feed and they want to breed during the fall. So uh, as long as we are not negatively influencing that, they will move more during the day. Now, however, we know that deer are crepuscular, which means they move most at daylight and dusk, and that's what all the studies show. Whether that's, you know, breeding movements, feeding movements, excursions, or whatever, they move most at dawn and dusk. They move more during the day, during the rut, than any other time of the year, but uh, they still move a fair amount at night as well. They take advantage of temperature, they take advantage of cover, and uh, certainly the more pressure we put on, the more we will make them want to move more at night. Thanks, Kit. Next question is Patrick Roden Reynolds. Looks like what was the source of the Maryland movement study? That was James Tomberlin would be the would be the research site. Um, he did that on a place called Chesapeake Farms, formerly known as Remington Farms, on the eastern shore of Maryland. So if you just look up Tomberlin et al., uh, you'll find you'll find that. If you can reach out to Kip at his email address that he posted there, or or myself, either one of us, we can even provide you with the the actual literature site from that. Patrick, uh, Randy Wallace asks Kip, I check my deer cams approximately every two weeks, uh, year round. They're near his stands. Um, am I scaring the deer off by being in the woods that often, every couple of weeks? You certainly can be, and uh, I'm, I love to run cameras. I run cameras year-round as well. Um, I am super, super cautious about checking cameras out once we get into the season. Part of that is, even if, you know, you're, you're in there quicking out, 
deer are just on a heightened alert at that time of the year. You know, they just won't deal with nearly as much pressure. So uh, while much of the year, particularly the non-hunting season, every couple of weeks, it's probably totally fine. Once we get into the hunting season, I personally do not check my cameras that often. And in many cases, I try to, everybody wants to have the cameras near their stand, myself included. So you know exactly what's going on. But uh, I have had good luck over the years, and I know a lot of very, very good hunters that just simply will not put cameras near their stands so they don't have the temptation of going and checking them and introducing that scent right to where they're going. So uh, a good way to get around that is if you have to have it there or you really, really want it there, just check it when you go to hunt. Pull, you know, you can read the camera card or look at the camera card then or when you get back. But uh, once you get into season, um, unless you have a big, big property and very, very low pressure at all, um, I would be very hesitant to be checking them uh, all that frequently during the season, particularly as the season progresses and you're in those stands a lot more. All right, very good. Brad Reitz asks, uh, what thoughts on deer's preference of corn fields this time of year and then other times of year? Your reference, Kip, to uh, changing food sources and they're focusing more on fat-rich foods. Um, he says, my observations over the last week is that they've been hitting corn fields pretty hard. Uh, even though the corn's dried and seem at the most palatable time to eat it. So thoughts on the changes and timing of corn preference. Yeah, they, they love it when uh, it's in that milk stage and silken, that is like candy. Uh, they hit it hard then. And then after that, yeah, they hit it once, once it's dried. A lot of that will depend on what else is available. For example, if there is very little natural food or mast around when that corn is ready, they can be just pounding cornfields. Conversely, in my area is a perfect example. I have a lot of corn around me, but we are having a tremendous acorn crop, and uh, you're not going to find a deer in a cornfield anywhere right now feeding. They may go in there and, and uh, for a little bit of cover at times, but uh, they are just simply pounding acorns right now. And if you're in an area where there's many bears, bears are really <laughs> in cornfields right now, and uh, bear and deer don't like to feed together. So, uh, Brad, I don't know where you are, whether it might be somewhat of a bear or another food source, but... Uh, once acorn, if you have acorns where you are, once they start hitting the ground, that's that's king to everything else. So they're going to leave cornfields, they'll leave soybean fields, they'll leave food pots, they'll leave everything to get in and start hitting some of those early acorns. Thanks. The next one, Paul asks about uh, spectrums that deer can see and if he changes camo uh, patterns because of that. Um, Paul, it was uh, green, yellow. They see really, really well. They don't see. Um, or I'm sorry, blue, yellow, really well. They don't see green, as you had mentioned there, uh, that well. So your camo, it's not even the pattern that might be an issue. It's more of any UV light that might be coming off of it. Um, if it depends on what kind of um, detergent you're using, you wanna try to get rid of all, any of the ultraviolet uh, um, radiation off of it. So any comments on that, Kip? Oh, that's right. And. Uh... Um, I like his reference to pink, though, and there's actually a couple states and provinces now that allow you yep. to wear fluorescent pink. That is a uh, legal, you know, during the firearm season, blaze orange or fluorescent pink. So uh, deer aren't seeing that any differently than uh, than others either. So uh, um, my daughter wears pink. She likes some. She has some pink uh, attributes on a bunch of her camouflage. But uh, yeah, stay away from blue. Do not wear blue jeans. Don't wear yellow. Um, anything else you're okay with. All right, next one's Robert Koreski is asking, how many days or how long are deer uh, excursions? One to three days is about the average. Um, Ted asks, uh, when creating, and they're rolling in, Kip, we're getting lots of questions, this is great. When creating mock scrapes, what does research say about human uh, peeing in those scrapes or urinating them? How, he's heard it works, he's heard it doesn't. What do you think about that? Are there any studies on it? That's a great question, Ted. And uh, yeah, Penn State had a landmark study on this years ago. Essentially, deer are coming there to that scent. In the study they did, they used, you know, bucks, does, doe and heat, and, uh, and human urine. And the human urine attracted just as many deer as the doe and heat. They redid it. They used lion. They used new car smell. The new car smell attracted just as many deer as, you know, uh, the buck and doe pee. So uh, it's not so much a deer has to be in heat. It literally is. They see that exposed dirt. If you just expose the dirt and don't do anything in it, they still will come to that. They cannot walk by fresh exposed dirt without checking it out. So uh, I pee in scrapes all the time. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I'm a little bit frugal anyway, but uh, now there's that works and, uh, and there's research to support that, but uh, it doesn't have to be dough and heat. I didn't know they used Penn State students in that study. You said lions, right? 
Yeah, that's right. Done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Tom asks, uh, were the movement studies on large tracks or small woodlot tracks typical of, that you might find in a mixed ag area like Illinois? Were they, do you remember the sizes of those properties? Yeah, the Texas ones were really big. Uh, the, the, the Maryland ones that were not, you know, it was interesting that that stuff there in Chesapeake Farms, those bucks in many cases, remember Matt, during the summer, they yeah. had home ranges of like 50 acres, like literally five zero. I mean, because they had the food and bedding right close, so they just didn't go anywhere. So yeah, that Maryland study is very, very indicative of, uh, of the Midwest. Ryan asks, were any of the movement studies influenced by hunting pressure? That's a great question, Ryan. I'll let you take it. Yeah, down. they have done, some of those were throughout the year. Um, they have done some, and there's other studies I didn't reference here, you know, like uh, um, Clint from Ohio, when he was doing his graduate work, looking at those deer movements, like during hunting season, that was in Auburn. They have done some really neat stuff at Penn State, following deer all the way through and watching what happens when opening day of deer season arrives how some of these deer change and it's crazy how these deer, you know, like they'll be in an area, say they're going around like where my circle is here that I'm in, around and around and around the day before deer season, they move like all the way over, like three blocks over on the top of this ridge. And it's all because hunters entering. So it's insane to watch how they react to hunting pressure. So very, very cool stuff. All right, we, we are probably, we're, we're gonna keep going. Um, we're gonna try to end on the, on the hour. So we'll, we'll do a few more. Any questions that are not answered, we will reach out to you uh, with answers and we'll make sure that we get everybody's an questions answered. So we have a bunch here. Austin, uh, we kind of covered that one already. Uh, big Woods, food sources, they're going things with high fat. So look for acorns. Uh, Jorge asks, do does and bucks change their activity and pattern once acorns stop? dropping and do they go back to summer feeding patterns or something similar what's your thoughts on what they're doing after acorns slow down drop they won't go back to that summer feeding pattern but they absolutely will shift again and uh, remember deer are eating all kinds of things every day there's something they're going to key in on and acorns are often it but they're still eating other vegetation they have to to keep all that microflora in their stomach working properly so uh once those acorns are gone, they will shift to whatever is the next most abundant and preferred thing they have. But uh, keep in mind, they're not eating just one thing. There's still a bunch of other things they're eating. So those summer foods likely aren't available, but something else is. In many cases, it's shifting to, to browse and other lower quality stuff at that time of year, but they will absolutely shift seasonally to whatever is most abundant for them or is most available for them. Good. Randy asked, does moon phase affect deer movement? Uh, I guess I'll give you a short answer. It doesn't. There's been a bunch of research on that. Um, none have correlated moon phase to deer movement uh, or activity. Um, there is some new research that's being done right now to look at the ambient light coming from moon, maybe not necessarily moon phase because cloudy nights might affect, even if you have a full moon phase um, and it's a cloudy week, that could affect it. But no research shows any corroboration that that moon phase does. As much as you, you read and hear about it, the science does not support it. Um, if you wanna learn more about that, I suggest going to QDMA's website and just type in moon into the search engine. You'll find a handful of articles that really cite some good research on that. Uh, Joseph asks, uh, is there any indication that the collars make the deer act differently that they're wearing? Oh, great question. Uh, it, it doesn't appear so, and, and one of the the laws relative to that is they have to, they cannot exceed a certain percentage body weight of the animal, whether you're putting them on a bat or, or a deer or a rhino. So um, they have to be small enough that they just simply aren't uh, negatively impacting them. I guess we don't know what your buddies think of it. Uh, I remember watching Rudolph the Red Nosed Ranger and they were all picking on him like crazy. So uh, there might be a little bullying or, or picking going on in the deer world, uh, but it certainly doesn't seem to impact uh, behavior. From, from a movement or a survival standpoint. And some of the stuff they have now is some of the tags, you know, you can't even see, they have tiny little tags in the deer's ear that have GPS capabilities that, uh, you know, unless you have the deer in your hand, you won't even see it. So they aren't, they aren't those huge collars. We still have those, but uh, they continue to get smaller and smaller. So uh, those seem to be negatively impacting uh, how they behave. Another good question. Ryan Butler asks, given sparring activity, any thoughts on rattling during the pre-rut to, to stimulate movement um, or will rattling trump acorns or other food sources? I don't think that's a good question, Ryan. And uh, um, 
Actually, Ryan, you appreciate this. That the picture I showed at the end of my son there was actually two uh, deer from your state that uh, that he shot last month. So uh, we're, we're helping out from the antlerless side. Um, I don't think that the rattling wood um, is that wise in a pre rut. And then part of that is much of that early sparring are by younger animals, um, you know, as they're developing all that. So um, I think it's, I, I like to be aggressive when I'm hunting, you know, we often are calling, um, but. Um, they're not going to trump acorns early on, so uh, I'm not a big rattler. I've, I've seen a lot of people scare a lot of deer um, rattling. If you're in an area that has like South Texas where there's an overabundance of mature deer, you probably can do that fairly successfully during the pre-rut, but in most places where you have a balanced age structure or a younger age structure, that, that's simply not a good technique in, in most cases. We got another from question. My experience anyway, I should say, from my experience on that, Ryan, I wouldn't do it. Thanks, Kip. Another question. When you're hunting a mature buck every weekend in the same stand and he's daylight and when you're not there at all, what, uh, at all times of the day, what do you do? And I think that kind of goes back to your comment about that, that buck your brother shot um, and kind of the personalities about deer. Um, I'll kind of add something and Kip follow up. Uh, you know, a lot of it, obviously we all know this. I mean, a lot of it comes down to just being out there as much as possible. We know that some, from some research, uh, that have looked at hunting pressure and what the impacts on deer movement deer will change what they do pretty quickly after feeling pressure but they'll return within three days uh to a little bit more of a normal behavior so if you're out there on the weekend and by any chance pressuring that deer by midweek thursday the deer's probably back to normal patterns and then you're out hunting again so if there's a if there's a way to change what you're doing that might be one option but please add to to the discussion what do you oh, think, Kip? I, I think that's good. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, they they react immediately. But fortunately, our whole season's not done if we bump one. So there's a chance to get back after them. Yep. Uh, the Maryland study, did you did the deer swim the river? I'm trying to remember from that research, uh, Tom Willis. <laughs> they will swim the, rivers, but I can't remember specifically if there were deer that were crossing on that one. They swam the Allegheny River in Pennsylvania, and they've swam a long way. Um, I don't remember if they did in Maryland or not. All right. Mark asked, this probably be our last question. We got five more minutes. Um, what are the large boils or lumps that appear on a deer uh, at times, those big black uh, lumps? You want to take that one too? Sure. Those are fibromas, uh, cutaneous fibromas. They're essentially warts. Um, they can get them anywhere on their body. Um, I'm hoping that's what he's talking about anyway. I think so, uh, yeah. They're, uh, they're a, you know, it's not a health factor. As long as deer, they don't hinder a deer's ability to see or eat, they're okay. Occasionally, if they get too big, you can get a, a, a bacterial infection in those, which is not good for deer. But in most cases, uh, and I have seen some pretty grotesque cases where deer were definitely being impacted, but 99% of the time, they don't um, skin the deer. They come right off with the skin. So uh, sometimes they fall off themselves anyway. So it's essentially like us having a war. All right. I hope you all enjoyed the Q&A session. I'm going to uh, ask a question here in a second uh, to make sure we give the prize giveaway. So don't log off yet. Um, a quick plea, if you're not a member of the Quality Deer Management Association or the National Deer Alliance, we'll, we'll be coming out, as Nick said earlier, with uh, some announcements here in a few weeks about our new name and some other stuff. But you can still join if you're not a member just by going to the QDMA website and click the join button in the top right hand website. Uh, a corner if you're if you're on a uh, desktop or laptop um, we could use your support we need we need the members uh, we're doing more and more every day in the advocacy front talking to state agencies and legislators and uh, the more members we have the stronger our message is going to be um, while you're on your website on the website please uh, look at the banners that are swiping across the front page uh, we have all kinds of ways that you can financially support QDMA even if you're not a member or if you are, one of our big sweepstakes right now is we have a, a Kentucky elk tag uh, that you can play, play by clicking the link, going to the website and getting a chance at a really sweet prize package uh, that includes um, binoculars, a rifle, all kinds of goodies. It's one of the biggest sweepstakes we've had this year and get a chance at a dream hunt for a elk, um, any, any species elk in uh, Kentucky. Uh, what else you got, Kip? All right. I, I'd say we, uh, I hope folks enjoyed this. Um, 
please come, uh, if you like this, uh, attend our future webinars. Next month, we have Dr. Bronson Strickland from Mississippi State University talking about antlers. What else are you going to talk about in November? And uh, it tells you that the size matters. And then he'll talk about the role of antlers in deer biology and hunting. So uh, we're going to mix this up as we go through with these folks. We'll have some QDMA staff, some researchers, some non-staff. So uh, we'll keep it uh, balanced for you and, uh, and keep it fun and engaging. So Dr. Bronson Strickland next month. And then in December, we have Mark Kenyon from Meat Eater talking about a small property case study, uh, what he learned on Meat Eater's Back 40, which is going to be super cool. And uh, that's all I'll announce now, but uh, you can go on our website on the, the Beer and Deer webinar page and see we have almost all of 2021 uh, laid out as far as the, the speakers and the topics so uh, people can pick what they like to see and uh, get registered for them and uh, share this info with your friends. And uh, we look forward uh, to seeing you again here next month. All right, thanks. So, so let's do the prize giveaway. Again, it's a two knife uh, set, which is really, really sweet. And I'm going to ask a question. I want you to type it into the chat. And the first one that answers it correctly, well, we'll get the prize. We'll make sure that uh, email me at mross at qdma.com or kip at the address he showed earlier. And we'll make sure we get your, your address uh, to, to send it to. So the question is, what percentage of yearling bucks disperse in the fall. See, numbers are rolling in. Oh boy, that's coming in fast. Uh, I'm seeing lots of different guesses. Like Ryan Butler was the first, Matt. I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Ryan Butler got 75, that's right, yep. So Ryan, uh, congratulations. Thanks for everybody for playing. Um, you got anything, last words, Kip? It looks like Robert uh, Kreski was oh so close. I, was, I think that was a photo finish that uh, Ryan was just ahead of him there. I am really glad that everybody can see as those come up uh, kind of what that is. So uh, nobody would accuse you of cheating or picking somebody that you shouldn't have. But, uh, but no, great job, Matt. Good to see you. Nick, thank you for uh, the great information to share with everybody. So uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, attention tonight. Share the information with your friends. Let them know if they missed it. They can go to our YouTube channel and see it. And uh, good luck, honey. That's the most important thing right now. Be safe and good luck, honey. That's right. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. See ya.